the reason the United States is helping Ukraine is not for upholding democracy or because it's the right thing to do. I mean, those might play a portion, but the real reason, the core reason, is because it is in our own self-interest to do so. I mean, you know, the United States is no different than any other country all around the world. States act in their own best self-interest. Now, that's my personal opinion. And I understand how folks might see otherwise. I just, since the start of this war, I feel like all too often the argument for why we should support Ukraine hinges too much on the emotional aspects because it's the right thing to do or fighting for democracy or helping Ukraine preserve their freedom, things like that. And I, I don't think there's been enough conversation around the strategic impact that Ukraine's success on the battlefield has for the United States now and into the future. Now, there was a recent article that really hit on this in The Hill titled, A Reminder of Why Ukraine is Critical to U.S. National Interests, published on September 10th, 2023. And in this, the, the, the reason that I really think that this article is spot on, one of the best explanations I've seen on this topic in quite a while is because it centers around that. It centers around the fact that the United States is helping Ukraine because that helps us. Now, that is not an entirely cold-hearted assessment. It is entirely possible, and I think it's actually the case here with Ukraine, that sometimes our self-interests can also be the right thing to do and help a country preserve their freedom and oust an invading force like Ukraine is with Russia. Now, there's two main aspects they get into here, and I'll explain kind of where my stance is on each one of these as well. But they say, first and foremost, the reason the Ukraine is important for, or the Ukraine war is important for U.S. national security is that Russia's invasion of Ukraine upset the long-assumed continental stability that underpinned unparalleled economic growth. Returning that stability to the continent is a prerequisite for any future progress. The United States, we are so interconnected to the global economy that, you know, like it or not, that's just what it is today. That the challenge here is that any sort of instability creates chaos, and we don't know what that means going forward. So the, the reason that this is hard to articulate and lay down is something as simple as it's for freedom. We're fighting for freedom. Who doesn't want to fight for freedom? Or who doesn't want to support democracy, right? Those are easy ones. Every, you're going to check the box, yes. But this whole stability on the European continent, how does that impact us here in the United States? And the, the challenge is that it doesn't mean, you know, if this war drags on for another year, it doesn't mean that gas is going to go up by $1 next year, or that real wages will go down by 5%. We don't know. It's an unknown. The impact to the United States and the global economy and how that'll transition, how that'll affect the individual consumers, the individual citizens here in the United States, it's unknown. But instability is bad for growth. Instability is bad for businesses projecting into the future. So until that stability can be restored and peace can be brought about on the European continent, it, it's, it's not clear. Right, and that's usually a bad thing. We like what what we're used to. All of us, you know, I'm I'm 37. Uh, for our entire lives, we've had this general stability throughout the world, and we've seen, generally speaking, continued economic growth to where we can appreciate the standard of living that we have today. When you add in the instability of a major war on the European continent, who knows what it looks like next year, the year after, five years after that. Now, in a more straightforward approach, and this one I think is, is much easier to articulate and understand, they say militarily, a conventionally weakened Russia is also in America's interest. While far from defeated, a degraded Russian military is one that will pose less of a direct military threat to European security and will be in a weaker position to pursue any predatory designs it may have in the near term. This shouldn't be a surprise for anybody, right? The United States and Russia have not, in a very long time, been close friends and close allies. We've been manageable partners, at best, right? There's certainly been ups and there's been downs, but if you look at any national security strategy or, or document or policy focused on U.S. national defense, every single time Russia is brought up as a significant threat to our national defense and our interests abroad. So anything that is going to degrade the Russian military is a direct and obvious benefit to the United States, right? It's one of our major adversaries. It's one of the countries that we prepare for war against in the U.S. military and have for decades. Right? So the idea that their military is weaker and we are you know, not having to spend our own lives on that. We're having to spend money, but realistically, it's a very small percentage of the overall defense budget. The fact that that is reducing Russian military capability, it's like that is a pretty clear you know, victory for U.S. national defense, right? 
Now you can take that a little bit too far. The article continues saying cynically, the longer the war continues and the more degraded Russia's military is, the better it is for European and American interests. I mentioned that in a recent video. I think there's a possibility that there's a very cold-hearted aspect to US policy here where it's not necessarily wanting Ukraine to win outright, but the idea that the longer this drags on, the quagmire that Russia's military continues to have to invest manpower and equipment into for months, years, decades, look, it ties up Russia's military capabilities, ties up their focus, ties up their economy. Again, that's kind of a it's kind of a win for the United States, NATO, Western Europe, right? But the article comes back saying, yet that comes at a severe cost in terms of Ukrainian lives lost. It is therefore morally and ethically incumbent on the West to see the conflict brought to as swift and lasting a close as possible. I would like to add to that as well. So yes, there's the moral and ethical standpoint of, you know, I brought up that that could be a U.S. policy of just dragging this out as long as possible. I hope that's not it because to the point brought up here, that's very cold hearted and just it's, it's looking at Ukrainian lives, the people of Ukraine as, as just pawns. And I, I hope that's not the actual policy. Um, the other aspect here that's not mentioned is war seeds chaos. If you think back to the opening months of the war, there's a lot of conversation about would Russia use nuclear weapons? That hasn't been a real conversation in a long time. When is the last time there's a real conversation about whether a nuclear power would use that capability on the battlefield, right? Um, and it, it proved to not be true. I don't know how close Russia actually was. I don't think they were all that close. But the fact that that conversation was happening at all is chaos. And the longer that lives are lost in the battlefield, the longer this war continues, the longer that the outcome remains up in the air, the more we're going to have that conversation and those scares. They say supporting Ukraine and ensuring that Moscow fails is also an indicator of American and allied resolve in the face of naked aggression, wherever it may manifest. So this is the idea that, you know, we're kind of a police force on the world stage, like it or not. That's kind of where we sit today. Um, and we have to do that if we want to continue to to be able to benefit from the standard of living and the way of life that we have today. Um, and maybe this is something that, that you would advocate for changing in the future um, or, or stepping back to a degree or maybe pulling in more European partners to take on some of the struggle. I got it. Uh, but as it sits today, that is kind of the position the United States is in. And to walk away from that would put at risk some other allies around the world. The idea, you know, especially looking at, at China and Taiwan, would China, would China see the United States walking away from Ukraine as a sign that we would not be willing to go to war on behalf of Taiwan? I'm not so sure that one is necessarily an indicator of another, right? There are very different conflicts with very different reasons to be happening. Uh, I don't know that China should take that indicator as a sure sign of anything, but that's kind of what this is getting at here. They say there has always been and always will be an isolationist streak in American politics. The siren call of retreating behind America's oceans and leaving the rest of the world to its fate is alluring, yet foreign problems rarely stay on foreign shores. This then is raw, naked interest. American stability and prosperity at home are inextricably linked with what happens abroad. This is, I, I, I tend to agree with this, right? I My personal viewpoint, and I understand that there's a lot of different ways to approach this, but my personal viewpoint is that we are able to um, enjoy the freedoms and the standard of living that we have at home here in the United States because of our ability to project influence around the world. So it's not really the idea that things in Europe or Asia or the Middle East or anywhere are more important per se than dealing with things here in the United States with our own population within our own borders because we have a lot of issues, right, that need to be worked on. It's more the idea that our ability to influence events abroad benefits us economically to where we then have the resources to take care of those things inside of our borders. Now, I understand there's a bunch of different points of view here, including one that says you got to clean up your own house before you go out and start dealing with others, which is totally understandable. I, I can, can appreciate that point of view. From where I sit, I would say uh, that's not the position we're in right now. We're already tied in so much around the world that we can't afford to just stop dealing with you know, allies and adversaries around the world, it's not something that you could change overnight. Maybe over the next 10, 20, 50 years, if that's the direction the United States wants to go in, I think we could. We could shift in that direction. But as we sit today, uh, we can't just back off the world stage. And right now, the largest event kind of impacting the global economy and how the world is going to function going forward 
is the war in Ukraine. So I think this article from The Hill that I'll link in the description below did a really good job of getting into how it's okay to act in our own self-interest. And it's okay to say that out loud. Sometimes they line up with the right thing to do. And again, I think that's exactly what is going on with the war in Ukraine. But that's all I got for now. If interested, there's a link in the description to the national security sit reps I put out on Substack. It's seven to 10 of the biggest national security stories that week, along with a few podcast recommendations. But thanks for watching. I'll see y'all next time.